Okay, series is titled God With Us. This is part three. Are you ready to rock with him today? Okay, because we're, what, what we're gonna look at today is very, very challenging if you want to let God speak to your heart. It's gonna be challenging and uncomfortable because we're gonna look at a story from the Bible from a man who was, the scripture tells us that the power of the Lord was upon him and yet his life was an absolute train wreck. And most, of the, I wouldn't say his life was a train wreck, it's he struggled with what God wanted him to do and to understand who God is. Now see, we as Christians, we gotta remember, it's different than a normal relationship as we relate to God. It, well, in a number of ways, because it's God and not just another human being, but another reason why is, I, I, I said at first service, the reason I first started dating my wife is because I thought she was really hot. Uh, and so I didn't know much about her heart, but that's what, that's, what took me, that's what took me there. Why? Because I'm a guy, and as much as, you know, guys want to say, well, you know, I'm looking for, you know, a girl with a good person out, that's all true, but that visual thing is going to draw men quick. It's just the way it is. It's the way we're wired, and you're talking millions of years of evolution. I mean, this goes deep into the, deep into the DNA. However, the, being physically attracted to someone doesn't keep you there. If you stay with someone and want to be with someone because they're physically attractive, you're not going to be with them very long because you're going to, once you start living life with people, you're going to see them at, with, without the mask on, so to speak. And that goes both ways. You're gonna see him at moments where, for instance, like my wife is home puking this morning with the flu, and like I wasn't sitting there looking at her barf on the to- in the toilet going, it's so hot right now, you know. <laughs> Something has to, you gotta, tri- but once you get to know someone's heart, that's, that's different, but it takes time. I'm convinced it probably takes, in a marriage, and I'm speaking marriage, but, I don't know, maybe for us, I think everyone's different, but for us, probably about 10 years before you, before you really start to know their heart and you really start to feel that you're, a, you're as the scripture tells us, the two shall become one flesh, where that, where that happens. But that, that, that takes time, it takes commitment, and physical attractiveness isn't the thing that keeps you there. And if it is, like I said, you're in for a short stint. God's different, though. Because you know what's fascinating about Scripture is that it tells us we already know his heart. We know his heart because we know what he did for, for us in Jesus Christ. If you, if you broke the Bible down basically to one thing, it would be Jesus and his death and his resurrection for us. And no matter what happens in our life, no matter the troubles that come or the confusion that comes or the depression or the anxiety, all that stuff comes, And we say, why God? We know it's not because he doesn't love us, because we know at his core, if you got to the bottom of God, you may say, well, God is limitless. Yeah, he is. But he expresses his heart to us through Jesus Christ. That's, Jesus Christ isn't just a part of God's heart, that is the core of who he is. So when we define God, we define him as the God and Father of who? Of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. That's That's at his heart. And then you start to know him a little bit better in terms of what that means for your life and what that means for what he wants you, his will for you. I get that question a lot, what is God's will for me? And my answer is, I don't know. Because that, that, that's a thing that is through discernment, through scripture, through uh, wrangling and prayer, wrestling in prayer. And so, but we do know what his heart is. But as you begin to get into scripture more, you start to, learn more about him and what he, what, what he is doing and what he wants with your life. That's why I'm, I'm issuing that, the 15 Psalms a day challenge. There's 150 Psalms, you'll get through the Psalms in 10 days, 15 a day, not five a day, not two a day, that's not the challenge, it's 15 a day, why 15? Because for, it's gonna get you deep into the word, that's the most important thing, and when you get into God's word, God's word starts to get in you, and the Bible is the only book that reads you back, and you start getting read, your heart starts to soften, hearts start to change, minds start to change, mindset begins to change, the way you look at the world begins to change, the way you look at relationships, everything begins to change when you get into the Word. That's the most important thing. The Word gets in you when you get into the Word. Number two, you have to carve out time for 15. I mean, you're looking at 20 minutes, 25 minutes, depending upon the segment that you're in. I'm working right now, I just keep going. I'm, 
I'm working through today, and I haven't done it yet, one, Psalm 116 to 130. That's gonna be a hefty, hefty, hefty dosage because 119's in the middle of there, and Psalm 119's like a million verses long. So that's gonna take a long time today. So you have to carve out time. When you start to sacrifice and carve out time for God, your heart and your outlook and your life starts to change. And I think all of us in a new year, some of us maybe, want a new direction, want a new change, want something in our life. We want that, that joy, that purpose, that significance, but we never carve out time. And we don't, we're not in the word. So when you're not in the word and you're not carving out time, don't be surprised that you don't get a new perspective or a new significance or a new purpose. Because this is a simple axiom that I like to tell people, because if you don't change things, things don't change. And I know you don't need to write that one down. I mean, because changing things changes things. So that would be a tangible next step with faith is to dive into that, into the word and carve out time. But as you start to get into the word, as you start to discern what God's will is for your life, where he, where he wants your feet, where he wants your relationships, where he wants your money, where he wants your time, where he wants your thoughts. The Bible says take every, this epic struggle, right? Take every thought captive to the word of Christ. Everything that comes into that little noodle of yours, take every thought captive. It goes, it goes into captivity under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every thought, struggle. Because all the stuff that goes through here doesn't seem like it's going under the lordship much of the time of Jesus Christ. So, as we begin our walk and we begin to discern his will, what does that look like for your life? Well, let's look at this man's life or this story of this particular man's life who lived in about 750 BC, 750 years before Christ, so roughly about 250 years after King David. What happened after David died? Solomon takes over, basically, in a short span, the kingdom divides between north and south. Now, sound familiar to our country? Which is, do you know how David united the kingdom before that? One of the things that he did is he, because the north had a capital and the south had a capital, and what David did is he made a new capital for the whole country. And he took a town that was not quite in the north and not quite in the south, and right in the middle, and said, that's the capital, and that's Jerusalem much like our founding fathers did. They picked the city that was not, well, they carved out a piece of territory that was not quite in the north, not quite in the south, and they said, here's the new capital, the District of Columbia. Well, David did the same thing, but after his death, the kingdom basically reverts back to its old north-south divisions. When you read Israel in this time, that just means the north. When you read Judah, that's the south. And so this is now taking place in Israel in the north, and the whole country has gone sideways. What do I mean by sideways? Utter and completely idolatrous. People now have turned in droves away from God, and now they are worshiping idols. What is an idol? An idol can be anything that you set up in your heart that you worship that's not God. So they're very common still today. They'll never go away. Because there's idolatries of, we may not have statues of bulls, golden calves, or poles, Asherah poles, stuff like that. But we certainly manufacture idols like crazy. Money, relationships, status, you name it. And you set it up as the thing that you need to have. An idol is something that's above God, right? It's not something that you like to have. It's something that you don't have significance without it. This is the thing that brings me purpose. It brings me meaning. It gives me, it gives me life. And I, I wouldn't want to live if I didn't have this, whatever it is you want to define it. The country has turned away now to fertility gods, most notably a god named Baal and the female goddess Asherah. It's gotten so bad, you guys, that they've set up these altars of these idols in the temple. And so God does what he always does. He sends a prophet into the midst to speak out against these people. We're gonna be in 1 Kings 18 and 19, but I'm not gonna read till I get to 19, and I wanna go quick on chapter 18. 
Elijah is the prophet. Who's, this is who my son is named after, my middle son, Elijah. And Elijah comes to the king, whose name is Ahab, and whose wife is named Jezebel. And Queen Jezebel is no one to be messed with. There's no question on who wears the pants in this relationship. It is Jezebel, and there's no question about it. But Elijah goes to the king, Ahab, and Ahab says to him, Oh, there you are, you troubler of Israel, he says to Elijah. And Elijah responds to the idolatrous king, and he says, you're the trouble, troubler of Israel, you and your whole family. Now do this. He says, I want you to assemble. We're going to go to Mount Carmel, this mountain, and I want you to assemble all the prophets of these idols that you worship, all the prophets of Baal and Asherah. I want you to bring them all 450 Baal ones, 400, 400 of Asherah, so 850 total prophets, or 450 of Baal. I think it was 200, 250. doesn't matter. A lot. Uh, and he brings them, he says, I want you to bring them to Mount Carmel, and there we're going to have a God clash. And my God is going to fight your God. I love it. Like the teenage boy in me is like, yes, this is so awesome. That's why you got to love scripture, especially the Old Testament. Basically, Elijah says, okay, we're going we're gonna to rent, rent out the Tacoma Dome, and we're going to play a God game, and it's going to be to the death. And my God is going to fight your God. My dad's going to beat up your dad. You guys ready? We'll see who the true God is. So they assemble at Mount Carmel, and think about it. All these ba- idolatrous prophets are there, and here's only Elijah fighting the tidal wave of inertia of all these idolatrous people all around him. And at first he speaks to the people. He, Elijah goes to the people, and he says, How long are you all going to go limping between two different opinions? He says, if Baal is God, follow him. And if the Lord is God, he uses the covenantal name of God, follow him. But don't limp between two different opinions. In other words, don't be a 21st century American. Well, all religions are equally valid. It's just whatever one makes you happy. And he happens to be a Baal worshiper, and we happen to worship the Lord, and they like Asherah, and whatever works for you. Elijah says, stop it! Get out of that! Whatever, if God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Don't walk the middle, milk toasty, gross, lukewarm road. Which we do! which is exactly what we do. Then we wonder why we don't have joy in our hearts. Because you're limping between uh, two different opinions. And so uh, Elijah then defines the game. They make an altar. And here's the game. And they surround it with stones and wood. And they say, whoever can call on their God to call down fire from heaven and burn up the altar, that's the real God. And so, they flip a coin. They don't really. I mean, I'm in the football mode. They flip, a, they, flip a, they flip a coin. Baal goes first. <laughs> he elects to receive. And here's what they do. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And so when they call out and he doesn't answer and he doesn't respond, do you know what they do next? They start to dance around the altar, it says. They start dancing around the altar because, remember, when it's not the gospel, God coming to us and it's God's salvation that he wins for us, it's going to have to be you doing something to get to God. So look, it's going to have to be an incantation. It's going to have to be a technique. It's going to have to be a certain way you pray, a certain posture in your prayer. And now you got to up the ante. You can't just pray. you got to start dancing now. I mean, that's not real dance, but like... um, I can't, I'm not like my wife, she danced for 30 years, I can't dance, but, I mean, I can, but it's just ugly. So they start to dance, and they hear nothing. And I love Elijah, here's the teenage boy in me just wanting to jump. At noon, after a couple of hours of shouting and dancing by these Baal prophets, and there's no fire, no fire, no fire, at noon, Elijah began to talk trash to them. It says Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. 
Surely your God is a God. Perhaps, perhaps he says, uh, perhaps he is in deep thought. Maybe he's just contemplating. Maybe he's busy or he's traveling. Maybe your God's sleeping and you need to wake him up. And that Hebrew word phrase for deep in thought, you could also translate it. Maybe he's on the john. Yeah, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's using the head. You gotta wake him or you gotta wake him up. Maybe that's why he's not answering. Talking trash. A, a prophet that talks trash. See, so when, if you coach a football team or a sports team and you're dealing with kids and they're, they're, they're talking to the opponent and talking to the opponent, you, they, could, they could come back to you and say, it's in the Bible. Prophet Elijah did it. I'm gonna do it. And you have no recourse. So, so the prophets of Baal shouted louder. So look at they shouted louder, they shouted, then they shouted louder, then they started dancing, and now they gotta up the ante again because their God's not responding. What did they do? They started slashing themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until blood flowed. Not absolutely uncommon today. When we have, we, especially common among young girls, that when there's so much tension and anxiety and pressure and, or spiritual unhealth that they take to cutting themselves. It's common in our culture. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So the prophets of Baal have to punt. Now it's Elijah's turn. They went three and out. It's Elijah's turn. Elijah does something that's highly unusual. If you want to burn an altar, you want fire, he says, pour a bunch of water on the altar. Not smart if you want it to burn. And then he goes, do it again. Again. So much so that the water was now going into the trench around. I mean, it was basically Elijah just made a swimming pool with an altar in the middle of it. And then he prayed. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Verse 37, answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know, Lord, that you are God and are turning their hearts back again. Then the, fire, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trench around, around them. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, don't you wish it was that easy? Lord, fire from heaven, sure. My prayers don't work like that one. So Elijah must have some special, something special that he's got going. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And then Elijah does something that the teenage boy would like, the teenage Dan liked, even thought, I even think this is super cool, even though it's gory. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized, seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, and he slaughtered all of them there. Isn't that cool? I mean, look at this. Look at what we're dealing with. <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie Rambo? Rambo is like a one-man army. He could like take on the Soviet Union all by himself. You have Rambo here, except God's on his side. And, and God's got his back. Who in their right mind would mess with this guy? And so you know, after Elijah kills all 450 prophets of Baal, calls down fire from heaven, burns up the altar, takes the 450 prophets of Baal, kills them all. Then it says, then he tucked his, his cloak into his belt and, and is making off for Jezreel, which is the capital, where Ahab is headed to, the king. Why is, why is Elijah going to Jezreel? It's the final showdown. Because look at, think of it this way, you World War II buffs. This incident in the life of Elijah when he called down fire from heaven and killed the prophets of Baal, that was D-Day. This is going to be the taking of Berlin. So he goes into the capital of all the idolatry and figured that now let's burn, let's burn the whole thing down. 
Or maybe the people will repent and turn back to God. But look at God has started something mighty. Wouldn't you love for God to act in such amazing, visible ways? So there's no doubt that he's working in your life and you're on the right path. Because if I were able to call down fire from heaven in the Old Testament and kill 450 prophets of Baal, I mean, when it's just me and me alone on God's side, and I basically wreck them and their, their numerical advantage, ain't nothing gonna stop me. And so I go right to the capital of the whole thing. We're gonna end it. It ends today. All the idolatry, all the false worship, and we're gonna turn people back to God or we're gonna, or we're gonna barbecue the whole town. So he goes right to the capital. But on his way, close to the capital, or in it, Elijah, Rambo with God's backing, gets a message. Because Ahab had to tell the one in charge, even though Ahab was the one in charge, he really wasn't. He told the real boss, his wife, what Elijah had done to all of her prophets. Now, if I were Jezebel, would you mess with a dude who just called down fire from heaven and killed like a battalion worth of priests? With no problem, would you mess with that dude? I would not mess with that dude. She don't care. She don't care. Quote, she says, hmm. Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, may the gods deal with me. So she makes a vow. She says, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, what? You're dead. If I was Elijah, I'd say, bring it. Just call down fire from heaven and kill 450 people. Bring it, lady. You ain't seen nothing yet. Verse three. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Wait a minute, what? That isn't... I see some commentaries where they're like, this is the, the, the Hebrew author was not sequencing this right. This can't be, these, ha, these have to be, something had to have happened. How does Elijah go from this great and cosmic victory in the Tacoma Dome to now he's on the run? How did that happen? Well, one commentator wrote this. He said that Elijah was going to Jezreel, to the capital for the, the final showdown, right? And God is on his side. He just came off the biggest victory ever. And nothing happened. He got there and there was people still worshiping idols. Fire wasn't coming down from heaven. And the only thing he got was a death threat from the, from the queen. No action of God, no conversion. Have you ever been in that situation with God? I, you called me into this. I'm on the right path. I thought you wanted me to be in this relationship. I thought you wanted me to take that job. I thought we should have moved there. I'm, I'm in your will, and I want to do your will. I'm on your side. And you just, you've led me here to die? What, what is this? What are you doing with me? Now, my point is, if you haven't been in a struggle like that, God has never been with you. This series is called God With Us. You really want, do you really want God to be with you? Then you are in a struggle, my friend, a struggle of you told me that's the path and the path is going through thorns. I don't understand. I'm, I'm not being successful. Nothing is happening like I thought when I started to follow you. I'm on your side. You, don't, you give me a direction, but you don't tell me where to go. What is up with you? And that's why Elijah ran. And you know what he does? It says he runs all the way. Now, he's in the north. Let's say this is the north part of the kingdom. He runs all the way to Beersheba, which is the southern tip of Judah. <laughs> he runs all the way into the south, leaves his servant there in the south, and continues on into the desert. What, why is it important to note that he left his servant? Elijah, Elijah had a servant. Prophets had servants. Um, rich people, kings, queens, they had servants. Prophets did too. So what's he doing by leaving his servant there? He's firing his staff. Do you want to know why? 
because he's leaving the ministry. He's done. He even says, as he's running away, he says, I've had enough. Classic burnout phrase, isn't it? I've had enough. It would be better for you, O Lord, to take my life, he says. Notice on a total side note, Elijah in his depression, in his gloom, in his darkness, doesn't presume that his life is his own to take yet. So, some of you in this room, some of you know people who think that their life is theirs to take. It's not. And Elijah, for as bad as it is for him, for as dark as it is for him, for as gloomy as it is for him, he still knows that his life is not his to take. Your life is not yours to take. That's an un-American thing to say. It is my life. It's my this. It's my that. Not when you follow Jesus Christ. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You don't own you. He owns you. Elijah goes into the wilderness, and he keeps running, and he keeps running, and he keeps running until finally, do you know where he's running toward, we find out? It's called Mount Horeb, but it's better known in Scripture as what? Mount Sinai. And why is he going to Mount Sinai? What did God do there? Do you remember? It's there that God appeared to Moses. The Ten Commandments. It's sort of the culmination of the book of Exodus. He's going to Mount Sinai because he goes, I need to find God because I don't know him. He may have known a couple of traits about God, but he obviously doesn't know his heart because God just led me into the capital to fail and then run from, and then have a death threat. So I'm going to the place where supposedly God revealed himself to Moses. And how did God reveal himself to Moses? Fire. How does God reveal himself uh, uh, at Pentecost in the Holy Spirit? Violent rushing wind. How does God uh, reveal himself in other parts of Scripture? Earthquakes, these mighty, mighty, mighty acts. And so Elijah goes to Mount Sinai. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Hmm? That's a good question. What are you doing here? In other words, I sent you on a mission. I deployed you. It, my will is not incompatible with you in the midst of suffering and storms and chaos and not knowing where you're going. My will is not incompatible with that. So you think that when times get tough, and the road gets a little unclear, you think that that's incompatible with my will. No, it's not. You struggling, you all struggling in relationships or at work or or with whatever it is that, that is hard on your heart today, heavy on your heart today, and you think, where is God? His his will and his plans for you are not incompatible with you struggling. And that's why he says, What are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, you should be where I put you, correct? Instead, he says, you're at Mount Sinai. In other words, I didn't want you to go to church, the church building. I wanted you out in the mission field. And Elijah wants to go to church. And he says, Elijah wants to do, wants religion. Elijah wants to go pray. And there are times in our life, you guys, where we use prayer as a shield from being obedient. Well, I need to go pray about that. No, you don't. You need to be obedient. Usually when we say, well, I need to go pray about that, it's like, well, I'm going to go pray and usually get the desired response that I want. No, you have a clear word from God, clear word in the scripture about what he wants from you in your life. You know what he's after? Is not, well, let's pray. Trust me, prayer is essential to the Christian life. We need to be doing it more. But what he's looking for there is obedience. No, you don't need to come talk to me. I've already said what I need to say to you. Go. I want you in the middle of the danger, Elijah. I want you in the midst of all these idolatrous people. I want you bringing my word to them. I want you changing this with the power of my word. You don't need to be in church right now. 
You need to be out there making a difference for my kingdom and it's gonna be risky, it's gonna be dangerous, it's gonna be scary, you're gonna, you're gonna wrestle with where I'm putting you and understand why I'm putting you there, that's fine, but that's where I want you, leaning forward into that with joy in your heart because you know I put you there. So what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> that's what God's asking, what are you doing here? <laughs> Notice it doesn't read like this. Oh, Elijah, <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? How does he respond, the prophet? Listen to these words. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. What's he saying? I've been so faithful to you. I've been so zealous for you. I mean, I've I've followed you. I'm obeying your commands and I'm doing, I've been very zealous for you. But he says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I, I, I wonder if God goes, oh, really? Oh, okay, it all makes sense now. Thank you, I didn't know that. You see, when you're so burned out and depressed, you can't, you, you can't process spiritual things or even anything. You can't process things in a normal, healthy way because you're so spun around your own axle that all you hear is your own echo chambery, complaining voice. And notice he's not talking to a friend, he's talking to God, telling God, I've been, I love you and I've been doing a good job for you, but all these people, they've they've, they've rejected you and they've torn down your altars, and he says, and now they're trying, they killed your prophets, he goes, and now they're trying to kill me too. And And I'm the only one left. What does God say? Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, do you need your mommy, Elijah? Do you need me to rub your belly? you need a little massage? Do you need a safe space? you need your teddy bear? Take some time off, go take a nap. God says, all right, I'm coming down. <laughs> and Elijah's one of the only people that gets to physically have God come down. I mean, God did it with Moses. I mean, I guess he physically sort of tangled with Jacob. I'm coming down. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Imagine a wind that powerful. If I were Elijah, I'd be like, holy smokes, the wind is tearing everything apart. Remember, God came in the wind at Pentecost, right? but the Lord was not in the wind. That's so weird. I thought that's how he comes. Nope, the Lord's not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Okay, he'd be in the earthquake. That's more powerful than a violent wind. I mean, hurricane's bad, earthquake's probably a little bit worse. That kind of power, the Lord's gotta be present there because he is present in other parts of scripture in an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came, came a fire. Okay, now we're getting into more Mount Sinai territory, right? How he appeared to Moses in fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came the sound of sheer silence. What does that tell you about God? He may not come the way you think. As a matter of fact, it makes sense for Elijah to expect him to come in the fire and the earthquake and the wind, and God didn't. He came in the most backward, unseen, quiet way imaginable. And not in the mighty and in the powerful and in the, in the majestic. He came in the sound of still silence. This is, this is, this is a pointer to Jesus Christ. How does Jesus Christ come? Does he come in the mighty wind like a conquering hero, victorious? No. Does he come in the fire? He comes to destroy everything and he's mighty and he's powerful? No. He comes as an outcast. He comes as one who is rejected. He comes as one who appears weak. He comes as one who's homeless. He comes as one who has no place to lay his head. And he, he in, his, in his consummate act of love, 
He dies penniless, clothless, on a cross. See, that's the sheer silence. We do, the unexpected spot where God is located. When Elijah heard the sound of the gentle whisper, the sheer silence, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The voice said to him, what's God going to say? What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question, much closer. Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Oh, come on, get some new material. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to, the, go to the desert of Damascus. When you're there, anoint Hazael king over Aram, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And here's the line that I really want you to listen to closely. And I want you to appoint, or excuse me, anoint Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha. I want you to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. No shoulder rub. He gets, you're fired. That's what he gets. You're fired, Elijah. Lesson to be learned when God comes near. He wants to use us. If we do not prove to be faithful instruments of his purpose, faithful instruments of his purpose, he will find others. Okay, fine, Elijah. Elijah, you don't want to do my will? Don't want to follow my way? You want to just sit there and gripe and complain about the spots that I intentionally put you in, by the way, and you have to lecture me on where you're having trouble and what we need to do and, and talk like a complete burnout, saying like I'm the only one left? And by the way, at the end of the passage, God says, and by the way, you're not the only one left. I have thousands that you don't know about. So maybe just for a second, could I be God and you could be a creature? Or it, it's like Luther's, Luther's, I've told you this before, Luther's buddy, Philip Melanchthon, was the worry wart of the whole Reformation. Well, what do we do about this? And what time is that? And how do, how do we make sure? And oh, da, 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 da. He's always worrying, and Luther put his short arm around him one day, and he said, his name was Philip Melanchthon, he said, Luther goes, I love Luther. He goes, let Philip cease to rule the world. Put your name in there. Let Dan cease to rule the world. God will get his work done with or without us. God doesn't need Dan Shaw in the ministry to get, accomplish his purposes. God doesn't need you. He wants you. He wants to use a manual. God doesn't need it. I mean, if we don't prove to be faithful instruments, that's a quote from Luther, he'll just find someone else. It's that simple. But when we pray, thy will be done, we're praying, hey, I know you're gonna get your will done with or without me, but I wanna be on the ride. I want to go with you. And if he says, okay, if you want to go with me, Jesus, what did he say? If you want to be my follower, you need to deny yourself. That's number one. What do you mean deny myself? We believe in indulging myself. That's our culture. Indulge thyself. No, Jesus says, I'm going to run you opposite to your culture to the point where with your culture, if it doesn't feel, you're supposed to love people in the culture, but you're not supposed to be of them. And if you're walking with me and it doesn't feel like sandpaper on your culture, you're walking, you're not walking with me. So you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, that is, you have to die and follow me for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who want to lose their life, Jesus says, for me and for the sake of the gospel will find it. For what can a person gain if, if, if they gain the whole world and yet what? Forfeit their very soul. Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? That's what it means to be along for the ride. When God comes near, he's going to commission you with purpose. He's going to commission you with significance. And the way is going to be cloudy. The way is going to be hazy. It's going to be unclear. You, just, you have a general direction. But you know where your captain is walking ahead of you. But you don't be like Elijah and question God's will and God's purposes for your life right where the point God's having him work the best. It's just because he can't see. Elijah doesn't like faith, in other words. Because faith, what does Hebrews tell us? It's the hope and the conviction of things that you can't see. And if you like to see the way ahead, if you like to know the plan, exactly where the turn's gonna be, exactly where you're gonna encounter a, a hill or a dip, then 
give up on Christianity because he will never operate that way. And so if you want to follow him, if you want to have meaning and purpose and significance, you need to be comfortable with the tension. You need to, you need to, when he comes near, there's going to be a commissioning, but there's going to be a struggle with it. By the way, though, Elijah has a little bit of redemption to him. He's, he's basically, besides, I guess, Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration, one of the only people who shows up in the New Testament physically 850 years later. Not weird? 750 years later. He shows up on the Mountain of Transfiguration with Jesus. And then also, the la- one of the last verses of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, it says, God says, Right at the end of the Old Testament, he says, Behold, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn people's hearts back. And you just, if, in your Bible, if you just flip a couple of pages, I mean, you're going to flip through about 400 years at that point between Old and New Testament. You're going to flip and then you're going to see, and there was John the Baptist proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There's Elijah, back again, huh? His work now consummated and complete. Elijah was the only, one of the only people in scripture that never died. He, remember, he got taken straight, straight up to heaven because I think there was a greater work for him that was still to be done in the life of Jesus and it's to prepare the way of the Lord in the form, in the form of John the Baptist. I wanna share with you something as we close. I hope this is making sense that when, when God comes near, it's extremely uncomfortable. The way is going to be narrow and weird. But God wants you in that tension. He wants you in the, in the midst of the, in the darkness fighting. He wants you. you. You already have one that's fought and won for you. The one who took all the darkness. Jesus Christ, the one that took all the sin, the one who has the final victory. The, isn't that weird? The Christian life is the life that's to be lived backward. The victory's already won, is it not? So if the victory's already won, then why can't we serve in the midst of some sense of uncertainty of direction? If the victory's already won, and he says, I'm with you always, then all is well. It's, it's Mumford and Sons again, that band. And that one of the lyrics in one of their songs says, when I heard Jesus say, all must be well. So all must be well, regardless of what I think. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a, he died the martyr's death. Age of 39, he was a Lutheran pastor in Germany during World War II. He engaged in a number of attempts to smuggle Jewish refugees out of the country to save their life from the, from the death camps and the concentration camps. And um, about two weeks before his, well, he got arrested for being implicated in a plot to uh, kill Hitler. And um, he went from camp to camp for, I believe, about a year and a half. And then about two weeks before that camp was liberated by the United States, he was at Flossenburg, he was, he was executed. He's 39 years old, <clears throat> engaged to be married. He uh, was conducting a service, church service, the day they killed him. The Gestapo members, if I was him, came in the doors in the back, asked for prisoner Bonhoeffer. He had to come down. They led him away, stripped him naked, and hung him. His last words were to his friend as he was leaving church, who was a British pilot, POW, named Payne Best. And he said to him, he goes, Bonhoeffer said, this is the end for me. But really, it's the beginning of life. Would that we could go that way. That we could end that way. That we could live that way. Bonhoeffer uh, has this quote here in The Cost of Discipleship. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read you a different one. And I've read it before. It's in, the, it's in the preface. So this was published after his death, obviously, years after his death. And a friend of his, Bonhoeffer's uh, Anglican bishop in London, wrote the preface. His name was Bishop Bell. And this is what he wrote in, not the preface, but the foreword. 
to the, this book, The Cost of Discipleship. A must read for you. When Christ calls a man, says Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Christ bids him to come and to die. There are many kinds of dying, it is true, but the essence of discipleship is contained in those words. And this marvelous book is a commentary on that cost. Dietrich himself was a martyr many times before he ever died the martyr's death. He was one of the first, as well as one of the bravest witnesses against the idolatry in Germany. He understood what he chose when he chose to resist Hitler. I knew him in London in the early days of the evil regime, and they learned from him more than from any other German. I learned the, the true character of the conflict. Dietrich was crystal clear in his convictions. And as young as he was, and as humble-minded as he was, he saw the truth, and he spoke it with a complete absence of fear. Wherever he went, with whomever he was, with students, with those of his own age, or with his elders, he was undaunted, detached from himself, devoted to his friends, devoted to his home, devoted to his country as God meant it to be, devoted to his church, but above all, he was devoted to his master. When you walk with Jesus, do you see where that could, that could get you? But you will never find joy unless you want to plunge right into the hornet's nest where he's called you in the midst of uncertainty, just like Pastor Bonhoeffer. That's what Jesus is after. Nothing less. No half measures are any good, C.S. Lewis says. He wants the whole you. Jesus doesn't just want a part of you. He wants everything that is you. That's God with us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for, oh, Lord, the challenge of, of grace, the challenge of you calling us and positioning us into places, into our work and into our families and into tough situations where maybe in our sin we start to question you and what you want and your will. Let that not happen. <clears throat> let us be zealous for you, but Lord, don't let our circumstances dictate our faith in you. Lord, let, us, uh, let your Holy Spirit bro- blow through this p- place so that we trust you, not in, in spite of the storm, we trust you in the middle of it, and we know that you are stronger than any storm. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.